Thanks very much. No slides at all. So, Jessica, thank you for setting it up uh, very nicely uh, for our fireside chat. And I really want to kind of build on some of the comments you've made. So, I think the message from Jessica is we're not trying to invest in nature, we're trying to invest for nature. Yeah, we have a hundred trillion dollar economy per year that is addicted not only to the use of nature, that's a truism, um, but is addicted to the overuse of nature, the extractive processes of nature. And, and so we're staggered by the fact that we have to swing not just one part of the global economy, but every part. So let me try and unpack that just a little bit and then place finance into the conversation. So finance, of course, is the lifeblood of our global economy. Yeah, $300 trillion worth of financial assets across global financial and capital markets, of which tiny numbers, exactly as you were describing, Jessica, kind of flow into nature. You know, a few hundred billion dollars. Seems like a lot of money, but just think, the global food system is an $8 trillion a year food system, with the World Bank estimating negative externalities, so nature, climate, and poor health outcomes of $12 trillion a year. So if the global food system was a single company in a true cost economy, it would be insolvent. It simply couldn't function anymore. Um, so it's with that in mind that we need to think about how one begins to move finance yeah, into positive investments in relation to nature, not only but in addition to invest in nature. Um, Jessica has mentioned the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, and it's a good place and an important place to start. A whole bunch of organizations, including UNEP and ourselves and others, working with many parts of the financial community in trying to measure, inevitably, nature-related risks to those businesses, to try and measure nature-related impacts by those businesses, and to try and measure the dependency of our economic assets, we own a factory or some other economic asset, on nature. Yeah, pretty obvious, you'd think. Actually, not so straightforward as you might imagine. How can we get every business in the world, financial and non-financial businesses, to measure and report on their material financial risks, impacts and dependencies? And will that lead to significant shifts in financial flows away from those businesses that are nature risked, if you like, they need water, but there's no water, they're overusing water, they're destroying forests in the way in which they're producing food, and so on and so forth. The answer is, that's a great idea, and we should do it and do it quickly, but it would take a long time if we were only using risk-related tools to really shift finance. Why? Well, those of you in the masterclass will have heard the phrase I use there, you know, people from the financial sector don't get out of bed to measure risk, they get out of bed to invest in opportunities. And of course, risk is a piece of that story, but only a piece of that story. Axel Weber, who was at some point the chair of UBS, uh, asked the question a while back, I get it with carbon and climate. I get what the investment landscape looks like because it's all about clean energy. Yeah, I know what the technology looks like. It's relevant in our energy system. It's relevant in our mobility system. It's relevant in infrastructure and built environment. So I understand what the multi-trillion dollar investment landscape looks like, although it is evolving every day, every moment, in interesting and exciting ways. And he asked the question, what's the equivalent for nature? Yeah, are you really telling me, he said, that we're going to put trillions and trillions of dollars into regenerative agriculture. It's not to put it down in any shape or form, but it's to go, is that the play? Surely not. That's part of the play. But what's the technology play associated with nature? Because for most investors, they're looking for large landscape pathways where dramatic new technology changes open up multiple new business opportunities associated with different types of markets emerging uh, and different kinds of economies being shaped. Yeah. And so, in short, yeah, I would point to, and we can discuss this more in the discussion, think of food and think of food technology, 
So don't only think of regenerative agriculture, but think of vertical farming, think of uh, alternate protein, think of uh, lab-grown cotton, think of lab-grown leather, think of the technology shifts that are equivalent to solar and wind 10, 15 years ago that today we can't really quite imagine as a scale play, but are likely to be a significant part of how we align global financial flows with nature-positive outcomes. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Simon. Jessica, come join us. I hope you're all ready. We're doing about 25 minutes of conversation. First, we're going to talk to, to people on the finance side of things, and then I have a fireside chat on the corporate responsibility side of things, and then I have no speakers, and it's just you and I talking. So get really comfortable <laughs> with Slido, because uh, for the next 25 minutes, we want to make this multi-conversational. I am only a conduit for your questions over here. Okay, first question. While you choose your dark chocolate and your milk chocolate, you deserve it. You worked for it. <laughs> question number one. Are some species meant to disappear naturally as part of evolution? Are we meant to protect them all? Uh, if not, which ones deserve to survive? Maybe that's a question for Thomas. Um, but do you guys have a comment on that? I would agree. It's a question for Tom. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll let Thomas uh, come to that. But let's talk about this. How can we make humanity understand the non-monetary value of nature? Yeah. That's for you guys. I'm happy to take that. Sure. So I think the non-monetary value of nature is something that all of us intuitively understand, but it's very personal and it's very localized. And I think this view of nature where we can connect to it, enjoy it, you know, we love a variety of foods from our home and it has a special place in our heart. So I think that these connections that are non-monetary are known to us and somehow we need to carry those into our our jobs, you know, if we work in uh, finance or business to, you know, convert that, but also universalize it in some way so that, um, you know, we can understand that other non-monetary values of nature are valuable to other humans who have rights and agency and who we respect. Can I give it a slightly, so I'll, I'll play the technology card since that was <laughs> um, what was labeled uh, on my forehead. So, yes, absolutely, of course, and... Uh, you know, we worked in China with the largest fintech company in the world, in effect, and financial services, which is linked to Alibaba. We designed an app, uh, in fact, while I was still at UNEP, uh, and then uh, elsewhere after that, which sat on their Alipay, you know, so equivalent to PayPal or other ways in which you make payments. Um, it delivered consumers who were paying for things information on their carbon footprint, gamified it into a fairly addictive model. Um, when you built your little vertical trees uh, electronically, it gave you prizes and all sorts of other ways in which to socialize that amongst your own social media community, so no price at all. And within four years, 650 million people were using this app, and they continue to use it today. So it's actually the world's largest carbon market with no price and no policy. So, so what does that tell us? It tells us, yes, you're absolutely right, Jessica. It tells us that it has to be part of one's social identity, that social identity is a collective, socialized process, uh, and that we have to understand how that is being recreated within digital worlds in multiple different forms. We can't ask six billion people who are urbanized to figure it out with indigenous peoples. I just think that's an unlikely play in reality, that we have to figure where nature fits into a reconstituted understanding of identity within the kind of channels, including digital channels, that are becoming dominant today. Yeah, thank you for that. Jessica, I think this is a question for you. Um, so investors have to make decisions where they put money, uh, and there are certain KPIs, certain metrics that they measure. So the question is, how do you measure the value of nature-based <coughs> opportunities to pick one over the other, just like financial experts do every day with startups or investment opportunities? So how, how do you decide 
where to put the money and where not to. Absolutely. Well, actually, this has been the metrics and KPIs for nature has been one of the major tasks of the task force on nature related financial disclosures, which we mentioned a few times. And instead of having a single metric like greenhouse gas emissions, there is a periodic table which has the various realms like freshwater and terrestrial areas. And it also has ecosystem services. So the benefits that people get from nature. So because nature is so diverse, we will have different metrics for different situations, but that's not to say that they cannot be comparable and they cannot be used for finance because, in fact, we are seeing a huge growth in sustainability-linked loans, sustainability-linked bonds, sovereign debt conversions, and other products which are, you know, adding up, although still small, uh, which are now, you know, increasingly seeing some harmonization in the nature-related metrics. And the TNFD as a market-driven task force in communication with standard setters and in communication with regulators is helping that harmonization so that we can scale the market. Thank you for that. That question came from Ashima. Uh, here's the next one. The solutions and ideas that both of you presented, are these aligned to the planet at 10 billion humans? Or does the equation change as we keep growing? So let's make it tougher. That seems too easy. You know, are they aligned with 10 billion people at two degrees plus? Yeah, because that makes it an awful lot more complicated, but probably an awful lot more realistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, when I was at Davos in January, there was one of these wonderful dinner conversations that I was part of, um, where a group of uh, companies were talking about how they were doing inset investing in the regeneration of soil in Ghana for cocoa producers, yeah, and that that would lead to improved livelihood, improved quality of cocoa. Yeah, then Nestle or others could buy the stuff, make chocolate, oops, here it is, uh, away we go. Right. And I asked the question, what does that look like at two degrees plus? Yeah, is any of that soil really left? Or are we talking now dust? Yeah, and if it's true for Ghana, then it's true for four and a half billion people yeah, who live around the tropics. Yeah, and the answer, of course, in the room was, oh my God, you're being very pessimistic. I'm sure we can keep it under one and a half degrees. I won't do a little poll test as to how people view that right now, but let's take it as a piece of optimism on their part. Yeah, and then the second part of the answer was, well, we're helping them because today we can help them, even if in 20 years' time, cocoa production in Ghana is not possible, to which I went, well, that may be true, but the other view is that you're locking them into a livelihood model rather than helping them transition into something else. What happens when we're 15 years down the road, the soil is degraded beyond repair, uh, does Nestle and others still hang around, or do they head off at that point and not really help with the transition? To which the next part of the answer was, well, maybe it's not really our problem, it's somebody else's problem. So, I don't think you should think about that through the lens of Davos. I think you should think about it through the lens of us all kind of which piece of this problem are we willing to pick up? <clears throat> and as things begin to get worse, yeah, um, not worse because there are more people, but worse because of climate change, yeah, our relationship with nature, our investment in nature, the productive nature of nature for us, you know, will be increasingly under threat, and those livelihood models that are dependent on nature will need to transition into other livelihood and indeed survival opportunities. And the question is, what role do we, the global elite, play in that process? Do we draw up the drawbridges um, because there are 150 million people trying to get out of North Africa into Europe? Yeah, or do we play some other role? So, so I think the question is absolutely correct. I think nature is a piece of the story. I think population growth actually isn't the core of the story. Okay. I think that's a distract. Yeah, just given what the actual landscapes are, where we need to make some decisions going forward. Super. And a final word from both of you, because our time is running out fast. Given the scale of required transformation, of long-term impact that's expected, how do we reconcile the level of capital required to the long-term benefits? I hate to give a time limit on it, but if you've got 30 or 40 second responses to a very important question, that would be great. 
Well, I would say the level of capital and the urgency of getting that capital into the right places. And right now, we are talking about market-based models, but there is still a very important role for public finance, so basic conservation payments to those who are stewarding nature successfully and holding on to the assets that we need, that we don't need in 30 years from now in a restored situation, we need them now. Uh, so public finance is absolutely still extremely important. Mm. Simon? There's no shortage of money whatsoever. Uh, I think, again, that's the wrong lens. There's huge amounts of capital available for allocation, but at the moment it's flowing largely into destructive enterprises, or indeed not even enterprises, but financial instruments uh, that derive excessive profit. Um, our challenge is to redirect those funds, not to generate more. I think that's a misunderstanding about what is available to us. And the good news is that financial and capital markets were invented by us, and so we have every opportunity to change them. Thank you. Excellent. Let's give it up for Simon and Jessica. Thank you so Thank much. You.